Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining Dion Leadership. Today, we are going to be talking about organizational culture, and I have Tim and Steve here with me. I'm going to turn it over to Steve this morning, and he's going to get us started. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar on organizational culture. Our title today is How to Create a Performance-Driven, Socially Conscious Culture for a virtual workplace. And culture is really important to Tim and I, so we're really excited to have this uh, topic today. It's part of our, a, a series that we do each month. We do have a large um, audience today. We have about uh, uh, 200 people registered, but we wanna make this as interactive and informal as possible. So let me just start by saying, um, please do use your chat uh, feature. We will moderate that. We'll commit to no more than an hour to spend with you today and give you as much information as we can and do it in as interactive a way as we possibly can. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Steve Dion and I'm here uh, with um, Tim Coupler. And uh, Tim and I have been working together for a while and I'm just delighted to have a, a personal uh, colleague and friend on this. And uh, thanks for joining me, Tim. Hey, I'm glad to hear, be here, Steve. Thank you. So we're going to start by just giving a quick, quick introduction with uh, uh, about each other and both of our organizations, and then uh, guide you through what we think is is a way to think about culture and what's a pretty crazy time right now. Uh, so as it relates to our organization, um, for those of you that don't know, Dion Leadership is a global leadership and organizational development consulting firm, and we've been working with uh, a client. For, we've worked with clients for over a decade to really accomplish the mission that you see on the screen here. And so culture is a really important part of what we think you need to do to have employees reach this, this, uh, this goal of starting every day excited and ending every day accomplished. So I'm really excited that we can have this conversation today. What we do as an organization is really work in six different areas. And we've highlighted here that this is primarily in the organizational capabilities space of the offerings that we have as it relates to culture. But we talk about culture regularly, whether it's in individual leadership coaching, it could be in group leadership development programs that we teach, it's in team effectiveness. And you'll see as we unpack this subject today is that we'll talk about how you get to culture change through things like individual change, team development, and organizational processes. And then even in the talent assessment space, which we work in is also, you know, how do you bring in people with the right lens that fit the culture that you're looking to accomplish? So we do a lot of work with a lot of uh, different areas, but I have to say personally, after, uh, you know, 30 years in the corporate leadership and OD world and previously being a chief human resource officer that culture is personally very near and dear to my heart as, as you hear Tim give his introduction, you'll see it, it definitely is for him as well. And then these are some of the clients that we work with. So many of the organizations that we work with and, I, and we'll be talking a little bit about this, um, come to us for individual coaching or leadership development programs. And we're gonna talk today about how important culture is as a lens to drive the type of change they want to see within their organization. So a lot of global organizations, we work with a lot of manufacturing, healthcare organizations, very complicated uh, cultures, global cultures, and we'll be sharing some best practice stories today. So that's a little bit about Dion Leadership and myself, and I'll turn it over to Tim. Hi, everyone. Um, Human Synergistics uh, actually will have our 50th anniversary next year. And we're um, a global culture and leadership uh, pioneer. We have over 50 different assessments and simulations for individuals, teams, and organizations. Uh, one of our most popular is our organizational culture inventory, the most widely used and thoroughly researched uh, culture assessment in the world. And one additional thing we're pretty excited about, Steve, if you go to the next slide, is some work we've been doing to build a collaboration of culture experts across the world. And uh, you'll see on the bottom left there is Edgar Schein from MIT with uh, our CEO, Robert Cook. We've held ultimate culture conferences, a large global study on culture with OC Tanner. I'll share a little bit of those results. Uh, culture journey learning experiences uh, shown there in the bottom middle. And then we have two main blogs. I founded cultureuniversity.com about uh, seven years ago. And then we also have constructiveculture.com. So 
we view ourselves as bringing together a lot of the insights around the connection of culture and performance improvement. So excited to share some of those today. And I have to say, you know, Tim's modest in, in this regard, but you know, I consider you know, the work that we do as a generalist in leadership and OD, Tim is just a deep expert in culture. And I'm really looking forward to what he's gonna be able to share with us today. So the reason we picked this subject is, you know, we both know, and, and hopefully everybody on this call is here because they understand the importance of culture. But what we found is it's really, you know, effectively understood and cultivated within the organizations that we work with and the sponsor that a senior leader has related to culture and how to drive culture. So anytime we can talk about culture as it relates to business performance, we'd like to do that. Uh, we you know, know that a lot of organizations are looking to improve engagement, but we wanna help them understand what, how culture is really the underpinning of where the organizational performance comes from. And this year, as we all know, has been an absolutely crazy year with lots of tumultuous change within organizations, people working virtually, working remotely, changing business processes is going to impact culture and impact where culture goes. So I'm glad that you're attending and we wanna provide some real practical ideas and tools today as we think about that. And also this social conscious movement that's moving in organizations and you know, we've getting a ton of calls on the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And so how do you have an inclusive culture? And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And what's going to be the new normal of, of where we go and not waiting for that to happen? You know, culture is very powerful. I like to, to, to try to paint this picture of this idea that, you know, culture is like water where it will find a way. So it, it, imagine coming off your roof, rooftop. Water is going to go somewhere. And if you don't guide it, it could go to really dangerous places. It could be a leak inside your old house, who knows where it's gonna go. But if you guide it well, it can be a great resource and tool for you to use. So let's talk about culture as it relates to how we can drive and create culture change. So to get us going with this idea of what's changing in the workforce, I actually just pulled this from a webinar I saw in, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I thought it was a great visual image to just show how much change is happening in organizations right now. And what you can see is, you know, we're so focused and I, I, I'd offer this perspective and I'll turn over to Tim to give some thoughts as well. But this idea that, you know, right now we're really, you know, just tapping the understanding of what does it mean to even change the way we have our personal lives right now? What's impacted with having children at home? What's impacted with how we work at home? I don't even think we realize where it's going to change culture. So these are just some examples of things that are happening in our life. What was usual, what is unusual, what was unusual today might become our new usual. And what does that look like as it relates to culture? Yeah, this is a great slide. And uh, I think one important point is that with all this disruption and change, it doesn't change the definition of what culture is and what must exist for a culture to evolve. But, but how we interpret the culture has been like totally disrupted. The, the expectations and the unwritten rules that we follow in the workplace with all these changing circumstances, um, you know, it's different. And it's sometimes difficult for team members to understand what's expected in certain circumstances when there's all these things that are, are new and changing. Now, fortunately, that's an opportunity for us too to get intentional about how we're going to come together as a team and what's expected from team members to support our vision and performance priorities. So it's also an opportunity, not just a big challenge. So here's our roadmap for our discussion today. And again, I'd like to say, I understand on a webinar, you know, people might be doing some other things as you're listening to us, please stay engaged. And we're gonna ask you in a quick second here to actually use the chat feature. So if you wanna get that up, we're gonna just ask a question and try to get a sense of where you're at. So we're gonna go through kind of getting your feedback and then talking a little bit about some facts data and present a four part model on how to think about culture change in terms of the process and then give you some very specific practical tools and resources and ideas for the way which you can, you can approach that. All right, so, uh, well, why is culture important to you personally? 
right? And uh, please use your uh, chat and share your own own feelings and we'll respond to some of those, but uh, go beyond the, the typical quote business reasons that you might connect to, to culture of, oh yeah, it's great for performance or employee experience. And if that is your reason personally, then great. Um, but if you've got a deeper reason why you're um, compelled to learn more about this topic, then, then please share and love to react to that. So Steve, why, why is culture important to you personally? Culture is important. Now, you didn't tell me you were going to ask me that question. So <laughs> culture is that. important to me because I personally have seen in working in organizations how different, how the business results change because of the DNA of the organization and, you know, how toxic some cultures are and the impact that it has on each person individually and then how it translates into business performance. I've seen it personally for me and I've been in organizations that I didn't want to wake up every day and go to work and I've been in others where I was incredibly engaged and when I think back to the reasons why, I mean, you talk about, you know, your manager is important, but that's part of a system that came because of the culture in the organization. And now I'm really fortunate, you know, after doing this for over a decade, being able to pop in and out of multiple cultures in, in organizations. And in some days, you know, I'll, I'll be driving home going, you know, I, I was in four different organizations today and you can just feel and touch and see differences in culture. They don't necessarily see it in the cultures that they're in, but it's fascinating to me now to see how different cultures are. So I just think it's really, it's such an important part of how we uh, govern business. Well, we've got a bunch of comments coming in uh, about it. It drives everything in the organization. I, I've been in a bad culture. It's so stressful. I don't want to live with that again. And that's, uh, that's kind of why I have the proceed with caution sign here. Um, because what, why it's important to me personally is, you know, I've, I've seen the great uh, results from a team really being united behind our vision and performance priorities and, and just uh, so excited but I've also seen the ugly side of some horrible culture crises and been chewed up by uh, things that played out in the culture also. So you have an appreciation for this over many years. What are some of our other comments here, Steve? Uh, culture is the air we breathe. That's a, that's a great quote. And if it's polluted, that's another analogy we could use too. What does that mean? That's true. Uh, it drives and determines performance. Why are senior leaders so blind to it? That is a, that's a, that's a whole webinar in and of itself. Um, okay, well, good. I think as I'm reading through this, this is about where our content is going to go and hopefully help you uh, know what to do about it. We're not going to talk as much about why it's important, I think we're seeing here that we all agree that it is. Now let's, I guess, get into what do we do about it? All right, so we've got some background data to, to move through pretty quickly here. And uh, I don't know if you've seen on social media or whatever, we actually have record engagement uh, that Gallup has been touting with this being up to all the way 37%. Uh, of employees uh, engaged. But the flip side of that is obviously those that are not engaged or actively disengaged. And you know we're 20 years or more into this engagement movement with the lines looking pretty flat here. And I, my belief is that uh, the entire engagement movement, while there's been undisputed positive results from it with individual organizations, it's not getting to the level of culture. Culture is not engagement. You really have to do a deep dive beyond engagement to, to understand culture. And I think uh, many of you on this webinar realize that. Next slide. Now, another uh, huge trend is obviously with diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are statistics on, on gender. Click ahead a couple times here and then once more. I mean, these statistics are just frightening about how our organizations are not inclusive at this point. And this is all founded in the culture of society. And if anyone thinks these numbers are gonna move in a meaningful way without the culture of organizations evolving, uh, they're crazy. It's just not gonna happen. 
so we can get a lot more intentional with understanding what is truly culturally driven and then what are other things that are impacting culture and how do we approach uh, working on those things to have the outcomes we're, we're desiring collectively. Any reaction to this, Steve? No, I agree with you completely. And, you know, corporate, you know, entities are really a microcosm of what's happening in the society at large. People come into that organization as leaders, and we'll talk about where culture comes from in a, in a minute. But as leaders who make decisions in organizations have new experiences, they can bring those into the workplace or leaders can try to bring it into the workplace and it gets blocked and we keep an old culture. So trying to understand how to bring these uh, newfound thoughts, feelings, attitudes into the workplace, whether it's we can do things over a screen like we're doing today, whether it's being more inclusive related to gender, ethnicity, and age. I mean, the list goes on and on, but helping to understand and be mindful of the decisions that we make that will drive the collective culture. So I think we should get into how to do it. Yeah, let's uh, jump ahead here. Next slide. Uh, we also hear a lot about culture related to uh, crises. Uh, click once more. You know, there's every year a few major crises related to culture. The latest is uh, Boeing and the FAA and there being a culture of silence and things like that. And I love this quote from Edgar Schein that uh, bright people doing stupid things falls in a bucket we call culture. That uh, these organizations all have great systems, great processes, but it can get away from you if we're not very intentional about culture. Next slide. Well, and I'll, I'll, I'll add to this too, that you know, we get organizations that'll call us to say, you know, can you coach the senior leader in this one location? And we'll get into that plan or location and realize that there's a whole bunch of things happening there that the organization doesn't even realize is happening. And, 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 and it's just, it's shocking to see uh, pockets of dysfunction but I'd also say that the reason that we're trying to bring this topic to today isn't about just about those, you know, classic Enron stories of the world. It's also about helping you realize that a good culture can become a great culture and all these little things need to add up to make that happen as well. So it isn't just about, you know, the, what, the, the you know, tragedy parts of this, uh, but, but let's, um, you know, polish the stone. Yeah, and let's build on that with, with this slide because it's culture shouldn't be about um, there's a problem to fix. Oh, and, and, and that's the only purpose uh, behind really understanding and being intentional about culture. This is a major study that uh, we partnered with OC Tanner on uh, last year. And through the uh, questioning, it was determined that only about 10% of the respondents across the world, many different countries, responded that they work uh, primarily in a constructive culture. And we'll talk about the differences between constructive, passive, and aggressive in a minute. But uh, when you look at the outcomes these same people uh, reported when it came to higher customer experience, year-on-year -year sales growth, engagement, collaboration, adaptability, I mean, the outcomes that connect back to a, a constructive or effective culture are widespread. So it's important even for great and very effective organizations to be attuned to culture to stay ahead of other organizations and to adapt in a changing marketplace. I have to say that if I had a nickel for every time an organization said, we need have to have people that, that hold each other more accountable, or, you know, we don't handle conflict well, I mean, I, you know, I'd be rich. I mean, those areas are so fundamental in organizations. And what we see or hear is organizations saying, come in and do training to teach, you know, accountability, delegation, time management, you know, uh, but that is coming from culture. So I'd like to kind of connect the leadership development element to this as you think about how do you create a uh, constructive culture that maybe isn't passive or aggressive. Skill is important for a leader, but it is coming down to culture is where it's really being driven from. In most cases. So uh, 
Um, I, I like to say this, the top leaders will be viewed as financially and morally negligent if they, they don't understand their culture and deal with their, what they find, good or bad, that you're, you're not making the most of the potential of your organization, financially, growth, innovation, um, but you're not also not on top of what negative things could happen from a risk management standpoint or other areas because a effective or constructive culture won't guarantee there might not be an isolated case of behavior uh, that's harmful, but it will guarantee there won't be a pattern that goes unchecked. So let's really um, you know, do this for the right reasons to be able to support our purpose and performance priorities, but also this is important to make sure that, that things don't get away from us. And I'm, and I'm going to pause too. I'm seeing some things in chat too, where we, people are talking a little bit about culture and CEO's role and, and bad culture. And as we just saw on the last slide, this idea of constructive cultures versus passive aggressive. One of the things that's really important as a learning point today is just to have a model to talk about what culture what effective culture means for you. Because if you ask different people, is it a good or bad culture? That definition of bad is in the eye of the beholder. And if you're holding the keys to you know, uh, a kingdom that you think is, is yours, it might feel like a great culture for you. So be able to have a common language and a, and a, 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 a way to have a dialogue where we, we can see things we can look at our results and we can look at our processes and our behavior. That is a really important part of how we want to drive getting some alignment with culture. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about how you make culture and performance change. So we're going to share with you this idea of just a, of a simple four part model for our clients. We've used uh, various models. I really like um, the human synergistic model approach to this and making it very simple. But this idea of first understanding why to discover and align what is your culture. Some of your chat said CEOs are blind to it. Well, they don't even understand what culture is or isn't. So our job as practitioners is to help um, understand what are we trying to accomplish and connect that. Uh, I think the, the, the quote about culture eat strategy uh, was a, a couple times in the chat here, like helping to really drive that. And then building on a base is next, creating a change plan and learn and sustain. So I don't wanna go through it too much here because we're gonna kind of unpack this model as we, as, as we talk over the next few minutes. So, in terms of understanding um, the why here, uh, you know, culture just can't be the pet project of HR. You know, that's a really important distinction. It needs to be a business imperative. And so part of what we want to help you do is to give you some tools and resources to be able to identify how do you make it such and understand what it's really important to understand what you want to accomplish before you even start. So you can see, and we'll build out the slide as we go forward, what are those major elements under each of these areas? But in terms of understanding why, before you just start to measure things or make change or say, we shouldn't be like this, let's define what it looks like and why. And, um, and I'll give, we'll, we'll give you some examples here of by industry, how an organization can do that. So the, the key here with understanding why is that you'll, you won't see on this list, you know, create a great culture, right? Culture can seem like a bottomless pit. So that's why we want to be clear about the outcomes or results we're targeting. And then we can understand how our culture is helping us achieve those results and where it's holding us back. And, uh, you know, the framework Steve was sharing there, that's been used from everything from small businesses to some of the greatest, you know, culture stories and crises you've seen in the newspapers. Uh, it's more of a tried and true way of thinking, but it's always customized um, to the particular situation and needs of the organization. But the, the key is really starting with a why that's really connected to the, the purpose and fundamental priorities of the organization. So when your CEO comes back and screams and says, you know, why aren't we getting things done quicker around here? Why can't these countries work together? 
they're better, what, whatever those kind of in business imperatives are, we suggest that you start with, well, let's back into what, what got us there. And as you're again saying in your chat here, you know, the, having a culture imperative and realizing it's the decisions that we make as an organization are really where that comes from. We've been working with a lot of healthcare manufacturing organizations recently. And I have to say in healthcare, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is organizations trying to drive a, or, uh, a system wide approach for patient safety, for growth through cross referrals, through driving, uh, you know, efficient outcomes. And to do that, it's changing the culture around how each leader and individual who comes into work each day approaches that. And that has then become a galvanizing point to do culture work. That would be a great example. Now, a few of the key things with this understand the why, again, we, we can't dive into uh, all of this in this one uh, webinar, but a few things that are often missed are uh, really laying out the current state related to that why as far as current strategies, priorities, and plans, because often that, that's a big part of the challenge is people aren't clear about priorities and plans and what's expected of them. So we wanna make sure um, before we get into the culture assessment, we're really starting to lay out the current state beyond the culture as far as our plans and strategies. Another key thing that's often missed is uh, we like to talk about these history sessions because we need to understand how we got here, that it's not good enough to just dive into the current state and start moving forward because we can't really understand and connect the dots on the current state really well without understanding history. Uh, then it's much more clear how we got here, why it's uh, so deeply entrenched, and what are some of the things we built up in the organization. So often when we do these history sessions, we might get feedback. Well, there was a period of time where we had some changes in CEOs. We got a lot more disciplined and focused on financial performance. Ah, but that was the period where there were some unintended consequences of maybe some um, competition between teams and haves and have nots. So when we understand history, we can really start to, to tell the story with our organization of uh, how we got here and where we want to go. All right, now with build the baseline, now we're diving into understanding the culture, what's helping us with the targeted outcomes, what's holding us back. And, and again, we're, we're not diving in to take a survey or something right out of the gate. We really want to do some thorough um, focus groups, maybe by levels, locations, departments, understand the current language in the organization about how the culture is playing out related to patient experience or other priorities. And then the purpose of the survey is to help us bring a common language and measurement to the stories that are already out there in the organization and maybe illuminate some additional things. But the key is we're not starting with a survey to tell us what to do. It's helping us bring a common language and measurement to the, to the stories and examples that are already out there in our organization. And I'd say without data, it becomes very challenging for a senior team to have the same reality and align on what is current state and what they see might not be what's happening in an organization. And it's so important to collect not just some data, but the right type of data and information. And yeah. we want to talk a little bit about the difference between measuring climate and measuring culture, because many organizations that we know have an annual survey where they're looking at engagement, they're looking at satisfaction, they're looking at some perceptions of the workforce, and that's really climate. So it's understanding how do things, you know, how do I feel about the goals and strategies and involvement within our organization. Culture is something very different, and now we're going to really get a little deeper dive into what we mean by culture is the norms and expectations within the organization. It's those unwritten rules of what is how we work around here. And it's the assumption that we have when we see something, we always do this. And if this happens, this is what the outcome will be. 
and measuring what those underlying fundamental norms are is really what we think are the way that you can help an organization fundamentally change and understanding perceptions, attitudes, that's great. That's important as well. We understand why organizations need to do that, but it don't confuse an engagement survey with a culture survey. Tim, what do you think? Well, and, they, and they're both important. The point isn't to say if, if you've got an engagement approach, you've got to replace that with what we're talking about here, but you may want to do a deeper dive and really get to these unwritten rules. And what do they look like in your organization? Are they more like the bottom left, where people feel actually driven to take on challenging tasks, to proactively share ideas and plan ahead? Or do you see some of those examples on the right where maybe there's expectations of, hey, I can't really make a mistake around here, don't rock the boat, uh, or maybe we're supposed to be critical and, and point out flaws or push decisions upward and, and we'll dive deeper on this uh, in a second. So another way to put this maybe is a climate survey is how are we doing? A culture survey is why are we doing what we're doing? The, the think about culture as those thoughts that are running through your head. You know, the realm of culture is all about beliefs, assumptions, behavioral norms, values, these in, invisible aspects, but, but it's these thoughts that are running through our head about, about what's expected of us in different situations that's really driving our behavior. And just as I said what I said, I looked at the notes and somebody commented is analogous to what versus why. So uh, thank you, Dan <laughs> Green. Um, got some group think here going on. That's great. Um, let me pause too as we get into the next um, area and just make sure I appreciate all the chat that's here. Um, here's a specific question for you, Tim, and then we can get back into it. Tim, has your approach um, changed during the COVID period? Do these meetings work as effectively when held remotely in Europe? Um, we, we've had some uh, really interesting projects as far as, you know, everything being done virtually. Yes, it can be a little more challenging because, you know, as a facilitator, you're taking cues from other team members and, and those types of things when you're in a group, in a room, and you can digest everything. So it, it does take a bit more effort to connect on the side and plan a bit more. But again, it, it doesn't change what culture is and what needs to be part of the change effort ideally. Um, but it definitely changes how you facilitate things and what you have to do additionally to help support uh, communication and building clarity together. So another analogy we often use, this is from the culture journey and learning experience we built with Root is, uh, Think of culture and the, the current culture as being signposts, these unwritten rules we follow. And, and some of those signposts are blue or constructive. They can help us achieve goals like communicating ideas, involving others. Some can be green or, or passive, where we might avoid confrontation or push decisions upward. Some might be red or aggressive defensive. They may help us for a period of time but sustainability will be an issue. So what are the signposts we're following in the organization? How do they differ by level, by team? And then what's reinforcing those signposts? What are the rocks, the system structures, leadership approaches that have been built into the organization over its history that are the key to change? Because we can't work directly on the signposts in people's heads but we can work together on our leadership approaches, our systems, processes for engaging team members in improvement efforts. So we've got to understand them both, the signposts and the rocks. Next slide. And click ahead. So this is our, our working definition of culture about it being a system of shared values and beliefs that can lead to these behavioral norms that guide the way people interact, solve problems, but it's much more about the way we are expected to do things around here, not just how things work, because it's not just the behavior we see on the surface, it's really understanding these expectations people perceive. So this might be a good time to stop. I'm also trying to moderate the chat here and some of the private chat. So 
a couple questions around maintaining a nourishing culture when everyone is remote. I know we had the conversation a little bit about this as we were prepping for it. How, you know, how much of the remote thing is going to drive the culture and, and or is it if we were already like this in person, we're going to be like this while we're on a remote? Uh, well, it's a, a little bit of both. I think we're going to show a template in a little bit that might be useful as far as making sure we're being very intentional. Because, you know, think about when we were in person and our, our habits for goal setting, communication up and down in the organization for, for managing different things like, like recommend, rec, uh, recognition and informal feedback. We want to be intentional in this virtual environment and have approaches team members understand for engaging so that it's, it's very clear about how our habits systems are being adjusted in this virtual environment. I mean, we've, we saw a big spike in people saying, yeah, leaders are being a lot more empathetic. They're, they're communicating much more, but we've seen a number of organizations start to drift back to, to maybe communicating less and not being open and personal and checking in. So I, I think it's real important to, to reflect and engage team, your team around well, what are our habits and systems and approaches that are working? And then what needs to be adjusted as we get more intentional going forward? One of the first webinars that we did actually when we got into this post-COVID world is to talk a little bit about sort of remote and COVID. And, and one of the, the things that we said was that this remote world will likely shine a light on those processes that you do well or don't do well in the way that we do this. So I think we're seeing if you already had cracks um, in a team, in an organization, those cracks became, you know, crevices. Um, uh, if you had a really strong team, one of the things that I know we're anecdotally observing, and I've seen some studies of trying to track business performance and culture and organizational uh, behavior activities, is that strong teams actually are working really effectively remotely. If they had already built processes and systems for a constructive culture within that unit, they're able to use this remote world very effectively. So I do think that there'll be some things that will change the culture in our rocks and our signposts as we saw earlier, but a lot of the culture that we already had is being perpetuated and uh, frankly being uh, 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 highlighted, I think, during the way we have to operate in this type of environment. You can't hide. And, and some, some organizations maybe were a little tricked because, you know, it's almost worn like a badge of honor that we come together in a crisis. And we talk about, you know, that being one of our greatest attributes in some organizations. So, you know, when you're six months in, uh, we're, we're past that initial honeymoon period, and I think a lot of organizations see the cracks showing up. And uh, just being able to get a language and measure around this with a lot greater clarity, and to be able to, able to articulate for yourself, what, what is the from to shift we're targeting? So we're not trying to tackle this whole culture and just change everything generically. We're being very clear of, hey, if there are some challenges with avoiding confrontation, sharing our ideas, communicating upward, then, well, we're going to really zero in on that, but we're going to steer it towards our patient experience improvement effort or innovation improvements. So again, it's always connecting the from to back to the, the why or the outcomes we're trying to improve as a team. Let's get a little deeper, Tim, into this model that we're talking about to understand culture. And uh, it'd be great if you could leave us through. Sure. So the, this uh, framework for uh, a language and measurement around culture is we, we plot the results on this circumplex visual. And there's three major sectors where we understand uh, what are the constructive values and norms and examples like taking on challenging tasks, planning ahead, cooperating with others. So we do an ideal culture assessment of values and typically it's very blue. Of course, people want to see these expectations in their organization and they rather not see 
these aggressive defensive expectations like competing rather than cooperating, opposing new ideas, using the authority of your position. You can, you can imagine how that plays out uh, and impedes, for instance, diversity and inclusion or passive defensive norms like accepting the status quo, making popular rather than necessary decisions, never challenging superiors, not rocking the boat. So again, we're getting a language around, well, what are our values? What do we really believe leads to effectiveness? And then how's that compared to the current culture? And not the one current culture, but the different experiences by level, by location, by an ethnic group or gender, so that we, we really have an appreciation for the experience of different groups and then can engage them more effectively on improvement. And so if you look at these simple 12 items as a lens for having this conversation, you can see how different it is of a conversation you're gonna have when you have this type of data than if you have data around employees agreeing that they like their benefits or agreeing that um, you know it, it, it's, um, it's a safe place to work around here or something that you, you might wanna know for a different reason, but if you really wanna understand the culture and why do we do what we do, this, you can facilitate this type of conversation much more productive. And this is kind of how it would sort of play out. So this is our how culture works model, just to, to take it back a, a broader level here and start on the left side. So if you did an ideal culture assessment, it would be very blue. Um, the values would be these constructive elements. And if you're leading the organization and how you drive your philosophy, mission, goal, strategy, and all your systems, we'd expect the current culture picture, so to speak, to be similar, and we'd be out maximizing outcomes and results. Click ahead. Now, the reality is that uh, what we built up in the organization tends to encourage some things that may be very different than our values. So we're actually encouraging people to behave in some of these passive or aggressive ways. And that's not saying that uh, we don't experience the construct constructive from time to time or situationally, but the question is under stress and where we're trying to adapt and make change like during this pandemic, are we really living into the constructive behaviors and do we understand how we drive that? Or is it more of that aggressive and passive? So two of these columns are more about culture values and norms. Two of these columns are more about the work climate, but it takes them both to really get the understanding of, of what's expected around here and why is it so deeply entrenched. I mean, at its core, managing culture, I believe, is a, is a, is a change effort to have people shift their mindset. So this helps to inform a leader who says, wow, I really had no idea. I thought that when I was doing this or we do this, that is uh, uh, it, you know, clarity and what we find that it may not be. And in some of the large organizations we work with, you can imagine there's a different person running each of these boxes. You know, the individual level role work is run by one group or department, organizational level, systems and structures, so trying to have a cross-functional overarching uh, process for an organization to manage culture, I think is something very important. We're not gonna really co cover too much about sort of the governance system for how you do this, but imagine, you know, every organization has a budgeting system. You know, you don't just start by saying, let's hope we make money, spend as much as you want, let's see what happens. We have processes and systems and, you know, people engage with that overarching system in lots of different ways. Culture should be no different than budgeting, than health and safety, than uh, you know, customer satisfaction, but it's a red thread woven between all the different things that we do. Yeah, it's very common for us to work with a core team um, to help facilitate this work because it's not an expert approach, it's more of a learning approach to, to really uh, connect the dots. And other organizations have like culture ambassadors to be giving regular feedback over the course of the year and to help us understand what's what's really working and what's not. There's a couple questions coming in and I'll get to those in a second. Let's just kind of finish this little piece and I just yeah. want to acknowledge that we'll, we'll have a few minutes still for those questions. So as it relates to creating change, um, that's the next step and there's so many great 
awesome, fun in activities that you can do related to getting change to happen. I think a lot of places start with this idea of change, but they don't know what they're changing for too. So let's just have an event where we try to get people to, to be, have a better culture. Well, that falls very short. If you have all the data we just talked about, then you're trying to make change in some very planful, purposeful ways to again, try to uh, get alignment, to have people understand. You know, another analogy I like to use, because I think this, 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 this sort of shows for a lot of people is, um, when you decide to buy a new car, all of a sudden you're like, wow, how many of these cars are on the road? You never saw them before. And all of a sudden you're thinking about a new car and then you spot it everywhere. It's not that there's more of those cars on the road. You're just attuned to that. So when you start to have a cultural uh, lens to look at, you start to see these things, you can label it, and then you can start to make organizational change. But it's not a single event. It takes process. Yeah, this timeline we often use to, to help get a feel for what can be accomplished through those first three phases. And if you click again, uh, um, two more, there you go. The key here is that the plan is not put together at the end. It's a learning process to really kind of understand our culture, how it's playing out and driving results in a particular um, outcome area like patient experience, customer experience, innovation. And we're learning together how we're going to need to adjust strategies and plans for how we engage the organization in those improvement areas. So it's not a culture plan. It's how do we adjust priorities and plans for a, one of our most critical strategic priorities and how we're engaging team members in those plans. So there's always a kind of a from to uh, shift even from a, an improvement plan standpoint of here's how we're managing it now. And based on what we've learned about our culture and climate, here's how we're going to engage uh, leadership and team members differently to accomplish results more uh, effectively. So let's now talk about some paths for change. So on the creating change front, um, a lot of people say, well, well, what are the details? What's involved in that? And I, I found it very beneficial to think about three parallel paths. So click ahead. And those three paths are driven by these two fundamentals about culture. The, the culture originally is created and evolves through shared learning and mutual experience. We're, so we're trying to take the organization intentionally through a learning journey to achieve results in a different way but we're customizing that learning journey based on what we've understood about the work climate and what we're seeing in the behavior of the organization. So next slide to show you those three paths. Um, it stands to reason that if, if we're looking into the future and the culture's changed, well, things are gonna have to change in those norms and expectations at an organization, team and individual level. And I really want to start in the middle here because I think that's what's often missed is people will jump to leadership development that that's the solution or changing systems and structures and processes like after an engagement survey and that's the solution when really the learning process happens in groups and we want to dive into that in a little more detail. Next slide. So think about it as a petri dish and you can click all the way through this Steve where you've got to have the, uh, a lot of elements for the culture to grow, so to speak. And we want to have a team that wants to help, maybe is driving that patient experience effort. We want to have a very repeatable team approach on, well, how's that team connecting to leadership and then obtaining the input of the organization as they manage improvement. And then we've got to make sure leadership is, is giving the support and empowering teams and groups to be able to make change. So we're never going to change the culture throughout the organization all at once. So think about it like this type of culture where we want to be very intentional about where we're targeting and with what teams so that we can capture those learnings and things that work to share with other teams and manage on other uh, performance priorities. Tim, this might be a good spot to uh, answer this one question from the idea of this petri dish analysis. Uh -huh. And I know we said we would cover this topic. Will you share your thoughts about companies getting involved in politically charged issues like Black Lives Matter, for example, 
and how it's created more conflict uh, over cohesion in the work environment from a passive aggressive culture. Should companies steer away from these political issues for the sake of constructive cultures, unless the cause is core to their mission? What are your thoughts? Well, that's definitely a pretty deep question. I'm not sure I can answer it sufficiently, super fast. I thought I'd ask you before I, you asked me. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say we have to really take a cue from our workforce, right, in, in what we're hearing from our team. That if social issues have, have really disrupted the, the feelings and beliefs of our team members and we're being encouraged to, to take a stand and that it's the right thing to do, then we owe it to our team to do something that being silent tells a lot to the organization about what we stand for and what's appropriate. The, remember, we, we can't advocate for expectations externally in society that we're not willing to advocate in our own organization. So a lot of these things can be translated to our own team and what we stand for and how we're moving in an important inclusive direction. Um, I've heard this quote that diversity management is a change effort and it's a culture change effort. So we can use the, the feedback from our team like with, with any major disruption to funnel that towards constructive change in our organization and then maybe there are some statements we need to make externally, especially when it's connected to our purpose or we're trying to be an advocate in the community. And, and I joke about you answering it versus me, but I actually <laughs> I have some thoughts about this as well. And I do personally believe, and I, you know, what we're advising with clients is, is um, it is important to talk about all issues in an organization. It's just how you do it. And it might not be advisable to speak in terms of just a, a specific uh, uh, politically charged issue, if, you say, if you'd say, but if you use the lens of those 12 items that we talked about and talk about inclusivity and, and, and you can get at some of these. And then anytime we look at data, we, especially organizational wide population data, being able to segment it by population group, including uh, uh, you know, gender and ethnicity um, is, will tell a story of if each person is experiencing the organization in a similar way. And having a culture that is aligned is really important, not just aligned for a certain segment of people in a population. So then we can have conversations in a, in a correct way. But I mean, let's not fool ourselves that people aren't having these conversations because they are having them. They're having, it's like our water analogy. It's floating somewhere. <laughs> where do you want it to go? And so being able to have that, but in a very skilled, effective way, we've been asked many times to, to partner in having conversations with a senior team about the Black Lives Matter movement as an outside facilitator, because internally it, just, it's a, it, it can be a tricky conversation to open in a dialogue on, but being able to have it is important because otherwise you are generally saying you are in a uh, passive culture. If you're just going to say, well, I'm not going to deal with this issue because it's just too charged. It, it, you got to deal with it. It's just when and how and give it its time and space. I, I know we don't have as much time to cover that as I, we probably would like. So let's, uh, let's uh, keep moving. We've got about six minutes left. So we're just going to show some, some different uh, examples and frameworks. Again, uh, there's a poll at the end where you can uh, select if you want to get all these slides. Uh, but we use this often where uh, it's an operating model comparison templates to kind of lay out your current team approach, either as an organization, a department, a location, and you might change the, the rows to other system structures, those types of things. But the key is to get intentional about how are we connecting these to be intentional about behavior and the results we're targeting. And it's not just picking out, oh, if we just were better at communication, then our culture would be better. Well, that's not the reality of driving learning and results in groups. So these templates are, have been used extensively as far as kind of pre-COVID, during, and now that we're getting to a, a distributed work environment. And they'll lay out different columns and be intentional about the system structures processes. Next slide. So another example, that we've used for 
clients is this example. I, again, won't go into it, but just to share with you some ideas that you should create frameworks and ideas so that you can, you know, replicate, you know, create your soup stock and then you can replicate that if you will in this. So this is the way you work program and how you would go through a four step process to move from selecting a practice area to being able to get to the point where you produce new artifacts as we talk about in the cultural language to make something alive. Your version might look different. We could help you figure out what that looks like, but being able to have a program like that. Or here's yet one more example of a mindset shift model of helping an organization change their mindset. So what process do you go through when you're action planning to really not just say, let's do this around here, but really you know, using the data that we have, looking at underlying assumptions and beliefs that drive why we even think that this would be a good outcome and working through a very intentional model. So those would be some examples of things that you do in the change part of this process. Now to dive into the final kind of learn and sustain piece. Um, we wanna show a, a visual here next. Go ahead and click ahead. This is a, a typical uh, timeline where those four phases play out and the key is committing to an improvement cycle where upfront, we're committing to six months out, 12 months out, re-engaging groups in a very thorough way to obtain feedback on, well, what worked and what didn't with our improvement plans, for instance, related to patient experience that we may have focused this effort on. And again, we've got the plan laying out what are we doing organizationally with any subgroups or teams that might be focused on certain performance outcomes and then individually with any leadership development or other efforts. But the, the key is not to just start implementing improvements without clarity about when are we gonna get feedback and really check in on what's working, what's not and why. So we're guaranteeing learning. The only question is the results. And just here's another example, you know, drawn a different way with the plan that we, that we use for a client that is also showing this idea of the multiple facets of the activities that you do on the individual team and organizational level around a concerted effort together to manage culture, policies, practices, systems, and leader skills. But being able to put it all together is a really important step. And if we're doing the measurements, this is an example if you click ahead where you know, the organization had their ideal, this is what we really value, but you can see their starting point was uh, very different. And just in about a, a period of 16 months, they made substantial progress and, and really you can see that aggressive being reduced, the red and the, the passive and the blue starting to grow. But this should be a learning process and the, the first, let's say year or so should be the most difficult period. Then we're building on, well, what do we wanna do differently for next year based on the, the approach and what worked the best? So there's a, a key shift here that's happening pretty quickly, you know, in six to 12 months where we're going from this awareness that culture is important and lacking common language, measurement, connection to strategic plan and outcomes. And we're really shoring that up with a lot of clarity in a short period of time. So we want to close. We only have a couple of minutes left. And to help understand with all the folks that we have on the call today, what you're looking for we wanted to ask you, uh, if, uh, Lauren, if you could launch our survey to uh, answer this question and then we can help appropriately get you what you need. Um, do you want to A, obtain the slide deck um, and culture tools of the video resources in some, some areas? Do you, would you like to have a follow-up meeting on some of the subjects we had? And then either both A and B or neither A and B, you're in a good spot, but that can help us help you figure out uh, what you can do next and how we can help support you. So we'll leave that up. We just ask you answer, uh, you know, in terms of how we can help uh, support what you'd like to see. And this was obviously covered at a super high level, but we can dive into very specific uh, examples and uh, data if need be. And as that's going through, let's just uh, close up as well and uh, talk yeah. about next up. Sure, so uh, love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, please uh, reach out to me or email me at, at any point. 
I really feel we are living in a culture where new rules are being ex- established for what's expected in the workplace. This is an awesome time to uh, be interested in this topic. And uh, there's a two, two learning journeys, one for your organization and one for you individually. So uh, look forward to collaborating with you at some point. And thanks, Kim, for joining us on our, on our webinar. I just want to do a couple housekeeping things. This is the last slide. And to say, um, we do have some other toolkits on our website that if you're looking for some other things around like leadership development resources that could support culture, you can download those. Um, we're going to be launching a new training catalog um, next week with some new blended and learning activities. So watch for that. And we recently just wrote a blog on belonging. And as I was going through this, I thought, you know, the content in that blog is actually very relevant to thinking about the subject we have here today. So you may want to check that out. And then we are planning a November and a December webinar. We've got a, a five or six subjects we're trying to whittle down to the best two. And so look for those dates. They'll be coming out shortly. Um, thank you so much for uh, spending your time with us today. Uh, be safe, be well, and I hope you can join us again soon. Thank you, everybody.